So we're going to start with a little bit of background about myself, just so you know who, who's here, uh, what we're going to speak about. Uh, the journey that I kind of went on personally also parallels the journey of retail. And then secondly, we're going to get into the real foundational material. What is the context with which in our industry operates, and who are these consumers that we have to address? And so we all know about the much maligned millennials and the Gen Z and all of those uh, other consumers sometimes we deal with as kids. But the mindset that those consumers have affects people like myself who are Gen X, it affects boomers, it affects those who come after. So customers who want better experiences, better for you, better for the planet, products and services, that mindset is a global mindset. And then we'll get into the really core material, uh, something I call the boss model. So who is the boss? The boss is always the customer. And there are four pillars here that I hope will be very, very practically valuable for everybody here in the room. And these four pillars speak to the four key things that as an industry, we have to drive forward. So first is, what is the narrative? What's the story that we're telling about ourselves in the physical and the digital world? Secondly, what's really interesting about the nar narrative, it's not just the narrative to whom we are telling it. In the old days of marketing, when you had a narrative and a story and you put it out there, it's the narrative that is being told by whom. So the notion of your customers now being advocates, so we're gonna get into that, that's the second pillar. And then the third pillar, I think super exciting, since we're all in the business of physical space, what does it mean to have physical space in 2022 and beyond? So what do we do in that physical space? What kind of experiences do we create there? And you think about the digital economy, it's really fascinating. In the old days, if Linnea and I had a store in Philadelphia, and we had 100 people come into that store, maybe 110 people learned about what went on in that store, because 10 people told a spouse or a friend or something like that. In 2022, if 100 people come in, maybe 10,000 people learned about what went on there, because in the digital economy, your audience has an audience, so we're gonna get into that piece. Okay, so who is telling the story for you, and what kind of experiences are you creating in physical space? And then the fourth piece, which is of course pervasive, that we can't run from, and we heard earlier this morning as a key asset, are the data and scientific approaches we take to understanding who is doing what. So it's gonna be about the narrative, about who's telling the story, about how we best leverage physical space assets, and number four, what's the data mindset that we bring to that. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll try and uh, recap. I always remember from my old days as a professor, as an academic, they used to tell you, you know, you're always embarrassed, of course, presenting because your students have way better slides than you do. That's sort of a problem. But, you know, you tell people what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them, and then hopefully that works out. Okay. All right. So just my personal journey, uh, which has really been a 25-year journey in retail. I love retail. I love brand. I love consumer. So I kind of started out as a graduate student. Uh, probably like many in the room, analyzing data from Information Resources and Nielsen. And so, you know, if Coke drops the price in a certain store, do people switch from Pepsi? Do they buy more Coke? Do they drink more? And you find all these kind of fascinating things, right? You get people to have more inventory in the home, they use it faster, right? I can get you to buy 12 cans of Coke instead of six, you're going to feel like very full, you have a lot of inventory, and so you can consume it faster. And how do decisions around pricing and convenience and so on affect what stores people go to? And then not so long after that, uh, when I first arrived at the Wharton School, there was a really fascinating thing that took hold, was e-commerce. And the first version of e-commerce, I'm showing a company here, diapers.com. Any of you guys heard of diapers.com? Okay, great. The founder's kind of a famous guy. He started this company because he had kids, and he realized that going to the grocery store, not the convenience store, of course, we're going to make that key distinction, going to the grocery store to buy diapers was kind of a pain in the neck. The product was bulky, they were expensive, you have to transport them home. So he started a company as an MBA student in the executive program called 1800diapers.com, which then became diapers.com, and then sort of fast forward, in the beginning he was going to Costco in New Jersey and he was buying $20,000 worth of diapers on a credit card. Actually his co-founder's father's credit card, and then selling them at a loss, okay? Fast forward to 2011, the company was sold for $545 million to Amazon. And then another company that Mark started that we're going to talk about a little bit later on is Jet.com, which was supposed to be the bellwether against Amazon, and he sold that in 2016 for $3.3 billion um, to Walmart. So what was interesting about e-commerce when it first arrived was the fundamental notion that now the store comes to the customer. So up until, you know, 30 years ago, all of us who shop for clothes, for food, for whatever it is that we want, we go into a physical store. And the good news about Linnea and I having a physical store, the good news is we know the trading area. We know where our customers are going to come from. Our store in Philly, no one is going to be driving from Miami to shop there. 
So we know the trading area and we know it dissipates pretty quickly. So the good news is we know where the customers are, the bad news is the market is limited. In e-commerce, it's exactly the converse. The good news is the market is enormous. We can sell into the whole of the United States. The bad news is who's ever heard of diapers.com? So that was the second evolution of retail. Then the third evolution, which is kind of interesting, Linnea alluded to this, were companies like Warby Parker and Harry's. Anyone here I can kind of see in the back? Maybe the lights will come on again, so I will see the, <laughs> the count. Um, anyone heard of Warby Parker? Okay, fantastic. Harry's, okay. There's a lot, okay, great. Uh, I didn't start them, so you can hold the applause, but you know, I was an early, <laughs> I was an early investor. Uh, what's fascinating about these companies, these are the digital native vertical brands, and there's a lot that we can learn from these kind of companies. I was a small investor in both of those when they started. And then as Linnea said, now I'm running a company called Idea Farm Ventures. All we do is think about consumer and retail. We've invested in about 28 companies. Some of them 20% of physical space business, businesses like veterinary services and so on, and some of them are products that we eat, consume, and wear. Okay, so let's get into it. We're gonna continue in a moment with the Antipodean theme. Uh, being a Kiwi, I couldn't help but sort of put up a picture here of Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norway, uh, Tenzing Norgay. Uh, this is after they ascended Everest, and this really relates to you know, what we do in convenience. So if you think about what he said and the mindset that Edmund Hillary had, um, when he was sort of quizzed about this amazing thing, ascending Everest for the first time, I guess everybody can kind of do it now, but it wasn't so easy back in the 50s. He said, well, you know, you don't have to be an extraordinary person to do an extraordinary thing. You just have to be an ordinary person who's sufficiently motivated. And if we think about our industry and we think about a gentleman called Joe Thompson, 95 years ago, was sort of an ordinary guy who noticed what? He noticed that people might want to actually buy stuff on Saturday and Sunday and while he's working at the ice company, if he actually sort of wheeled out some bread and some milk and some other goods, that would be a foundation of a business, which now, of course, led to 7-Eleven. Um, and on a personal side, 7-Eleven was one of my favorite things when I lived in Japan uh, when I was about 20 for a year. And I used to go into 7-Eleven all the time as a foreigner, you know, sort of looking for stuff to eat. And then about 20 years later, I went back on a study tour. And what I was amazed about, you don't have to be an ordinary person Extraordinary person to do an extraordinary thing, just an ordinary person sufficiently motivated. Somebody on their team actually figured out that the mayonnaise on the sandwich that they sell about 40,000 units of that um, was a little bit too thick and it was making the bread a little bit sort of spongy and they changed the mayonnaise. And the trucks that they shipped stuff out in had individual compartments of different sizes for different kind of food. So the obsession of thinking about the customer, the logistics and so on. So if we fast forward uh, 95 years, what's our industry look like today? Well, there's a lot of things to be really hopeful and happy about, so sales are doing well. Um, we're dealing with digital consumers a lot, which is great. I love this little quote here. Um, so if you went to a 7-Eleven and you didn't take a pic, did you even go? <laughs> it was a post on social recently. So remember, in the digital economy, your audience has an audience. And one of the greatest assets that we have is people just love to come into our stores. They love to come there, they love to get product, they love to do it frequently, and they love to, very importantly, create product that also helps our brand. Okay, so let's continue a little bit now into the foundational stuff, um, really the context and the consumers. So I like to put this slide out here just to get the term unified commerce into our minds. What does unified commerce mean? It means we have to be online, offline, everywhere, all the time for everybody, okay? So in the old days, like 20 years ago, when e-commerce first came along, some prescient investor actually said, you know, software is gonna kill the world. Physical space is gonna be irrelevant. And a lot of academics took that view too. Of course, it's completely wrong. The digital world and the physical world are in fact complements, and this transaction happened on the same day, June 16th, 2017, the world's largest um, online company, Amazon, bought an offline company, and the world's largest offline retailer bought an online company, just showing how these things are integrated. So unified commerce is a key theme that we're going to address. This customer that we're trying to focus on, Goldman Sachs is telling us that this customer is largest spending power in history. There's all kinds of interesting things about what they do, where they go, how they spend their time and their money. But perhaps even more importantly for us is this here. This is based on some research that we've done at Idea Farm, trying to understand what we call the psychographic of the customer. Now, the demographic's important because it's a defined age cohort, but the psychographic is the mindset that affects somebody like me as a Gen Xer, and it affects the Gen Zs that come after the millennials. So the good news for us, if you go to the top of the wheel, you know, one of the things they want is they want convenience. They want it easy, they want it now. 
And if you go slightly to the right, they want things to be immersive and experiential. And I'm going to give you examples that reinforce this as we go through. So I seek out experiences. We look down to the lower left here. They're principled and value-driven. They seek to have a positive impact on, a, on the world. They think about things like plastic neutrality and so on. And then finally, of course, they're everywhere all the time. They straddle the digital world and the physical world. They think about unified commerce. So this is the, the, the context within which we have to deal with a particular kind of customer. Uh, a lot of us are global. Our customers are also global. So you have Soul Cycle in New York. You have Space Cycle in Beijing. You have the Museum of Ice Cream. Actually, is anyone here taking your kids to the Museum of Ice Cream? OK, we'll have another picture on that later on to talk about that. And then, of course, the Museum of Eggs in Shanghai. Now, of course, this has all been pretty rosy and good news up until this point. But also, and I haven't continued this into 2022, there's a lot of things that have happened in legacy retail based on our research where companies who've kind of ignored this mindset, ignored this digital physical integration, have unfortunately fallen on hard times. And some of these companies here that we know and love have actually gone bankrupt. So the good news, the tailwinds are all behind us, but the opportunity is there for us to grasp. And this is the lesson of what happens if we don't. OK, so let's now go into the boss model. I've tried to choose examples here of brands that you will know, brands that you may be consumers of. And this is really the practical framework that I want us to think about as we think about how to address this context and how to address that set, set of customers and to do it in a way that takes advantage of all the good things that are already happening for us in our industry. So I'm going to start, and uh, you know, if we had a chart here, we could play that little game of hangman that I used to play as a kid uh, with my brothers in New Zealand. And you know, I don't, I don't think, did Linnea say if there's an exam or something at the end of this? <laughs> I can't see the name tags because of the light. I'll have to wait for the lights to come on. But uh, there's going to be a little bit of wordplay here. And the nuance of these words, I hope you'll find them important. So the first piece we're going to talk about here is the narrative. Okay? And you will have seen, actually, just through being at the conference, the evolution of the narrative of what PDI is also doing. So very important with your brand that that story and that narrative is not stagnant. It's informed by your principles, but it's also informed by the context. So the first thing I'd like us to think about here, particularly as we're all together in a physical space, is what is a close relationship that develops as a result of shared experiences? Well, we call that bonding. And I want to draw a distinction here between bonding and branding. So branding is a name, term, sign, symbol, or design intended to differentiate one seller from another. That's the definition literally from the American Marketing Association. A bond as a way to think about brand is actually something quite different. So let's compare and contrast two brands. I'm going to show you guys a video in a second. So there's a brand called Gillette. Okay? And Gillette was known as the brand the best a man can get. Every, brand from, every man from Auckland to Zurich has heard that message and maybe has even used the product. That brand was built through top-down advertising, product innovation, and so on. And then a fellow came along in 2012, I'm going to show you him in a moment, you may have seen him before, who was a comedian. Okay, again, he was the Edmund Hillary mindset. He didn't have to be an extraordinary person to do an extraordinary thing. He was an ordinary guy who went into a Dwayne Reed in New York City to buy four Gillette razors to give himself a shave, and he handed over $20 waiting for his change, and the guy said, that'll be $27.13. Okay? So he started this company, and we're just going to roll the video. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are going to ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors. We're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. 
WeAreDollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. So the interesting uh, backstory on that guy, so Michael Dubin, you know, he started that company in 2012. And again, this is the fascinating thing about the digital economy. Did the guy know anything about making razors? No, he just went to a company in Korea called Dorco. He had someone else build the website. And this video he actually created to present to investors to try and pitch them, but became a viral video watched over, I think, 25 million times. The backstory is he started the company in 2012 and he sold it to Unilever in 2016 for a billion dollars, probably put $200 million uh, in his pocket himself. Okay, so bonding, not branding, what does that entail for us in convenience as we think about the narrative that we want to tell? So the first thing is our brand has to have functional, emotional, and symbolic value, okay? Meaning it has to work, it has to make customers feel good, and it also has to show other customers in the social group that you're actually making wise decisions. So a brand I put here, you may know, you may drink this, Lemon Perfect, started by Yanni, who was a basketball coach at Harvard. He used to drink lemon water in the morning to sort of get himself going and feeling refreshed. And so the product works, it makes you feel good, and it kind of shows other people that you're drinking something interesting. The second thing that's really, really important in the digital economy, developing this narrative, is does our business, does our brand, does our story have an authentic and transparent persona? So I always like to contrast this with an old cartoon. You guys may remember 1993, The New Yorker. It's one of my favorite cartoons about the internet. So there's a little dog, and he's up on his hind legs, and he's in front of a screen, in front of a Mac, and he's banging away on the keyboard. And little dog one says to little dog two, he's probably ordering some steak from steaks.com, and he says, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> so, you know, because back then the internet was all about anonymity, which it still is to some degree, but now, 2022, it's about having an authentic and transparent persona. So if you look at a brand here like Off Limits Cereal, you know, adaptogenic cereal with kind of a funky image and a story and a narrative behind Emily, the chef who created it, it's very different than a traditional brand like a Kellogg's that might sit on the shelf. And then the third piece that's really, really important is you have to create compelling content in an engaged community. And I'm gonna show a brand from New Zealand to kind of illustrate this point. And this is a brand sort of in some sense helping out one retail chain and not the other. So you might imagine, and probably you know from retail experience, diapers is a really key category for certain class of retail, particularly supermarkets. And that's because it attracts in family customers and they spend big baskets and all of this kind of thing. But a lot of retailers are in fact discounting or loss leading products like Pampers. So the founder of this company, Rascal and Friends, which is an unbelievably good diaper, now it's available in the United States, they built their own factories to make it, sort of went into the New Zealand, Australia supermarket environment, which is a duopoly with only two players, and said to the CEO of player number one, well, you know, your Instagram account has, you know, 30 followers, mine has 30,000, if you put this product in your store and I don't give it to the other guy, you're going to bring in these new families, they're going to spend a lot of money, and so on. And so he played that game and he gave it to one and not the other, and he moved the market share percentage points from supermarket A to supermarket B over a two-year period by about 4%, because he had the digital footprint in the community with his brand that allowed him to do that, okay? So the first thing we have to think about in convenience is what is our narrative? What's our functional, emotional, symbolic value? How are we authentic and transparent? What's our community who's gonna help us create content and keep that story going? Okay, number two. So number two, again, there's gonna be a little definition. Uh, any idea what this one might be? So it's all dark, so you could shout it out in complete anonymity and no one would know if you got it wrong. <laughs> so, who is a public speaker, especially one of great eloquence? Oh boy, you got, <laughs> I'm buying somebody a beer later on tonight. <laughs> so it starts with O, because it's the boss model. Sometimes people say Obama, but you know, we, we're in DC, but we don't want to be political. It's actually, it's an orator, okay? And the twist that I want you to think about here, you go back to that quote on 7-Eleven, that kid on Instagram saying, you know, if you went to 7-Eleven and you didn't take a pic, did you really go there? I mean, this is how people think these days. So I want us to be focused on orators, not customers. A customer in the old days is a very transactional thing, and yeah, maybe we compute customer lifetime value and so on, of course, as we should. But somebody comes into my C-store and I sell them a can of Coke, and I make money from that. But actually now in 2022 and going forward, I want to think about when that person comes into my beautiful, experiential, awesome environment and they buy whatever, 
They create content and they create bonds and they tell other people. So orators, not customers. And again, this is going to have three pieces that I'd like us to think through for our own brands. I'm showing Warby Parker here because I think they did a good job on it. Um, and so what they did, number one, this is what we all have to do, is create a shareable story and a reason for customers to tell it. So the shareable story of Warby Parker was that they were kind of disrupting this eyewear industry. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a backstory if you haven't heard the founding story, it's, it's actually very interesting. So there were two friends who met at Wharton, and friend number one, Dave, said to friend number two, Neil, he said, oh man, you know, I just took a trip before coming to business school and I left my very expensive Oliver People's glasses, you know, 500 bucks or whatever, uh, in the back seat of the plane. And I, I just don't think I can replace them because, you know, I'm a poor student now. And uh, Dave, uh, sorry, Neil, friend number two, said, well, that's really odd because before I came to business school, I worked for, in not-for-profits and I went around the world, you know, giving people glasses for like five and ten bucks. And by the way, that's a very empowering thing to do because, you know, if a gentleman in Guatemala can't see and you give that individual glasses and he can see and he can get educated and get a better job and help his family, that, that's kind of cool. And so they said, well, you know, why is it the fact that we're paying so much? And of course they dug it and they realized there's a company from Italy called Luxottica that effectively would go contract manufacturing maybe in China, they would own the brand relationships like Tiffany's, they would own Sunglasses Hut and all of those things, sort of soup to nuts distribution channels, so something that costs $20 ends up being $300, $400 to the end consumer. And that was the genesis of Warby Parker. So that's the story that they created and the reason for customers to tell it, you can see from the tweets there. The second thing that's really, really important for us to think about and this to me is absolutely fascinating, is who are these special people that are gonna propagate the story of a brand like, let's say, Come and Go in our industry, or a brand like 7-Eleven? Who, who's propagating the story? Now, of course, if it's someone famous like Ryan Gosling and he happens to be wearing Warby Parker glasses, that's all well and good. Um, I think there was a movie, you know, again, going back to that Aussie Kiwi thing at the beginning, you know, down in Australia and New Zealand, we're sort of pretty basic people, you know? We watch rugby, we drink beer, that, that's that kind of thing. But once in a while, we like to think of ourselves as elevated. So I thought, you know, I'm going to do something really elevated this weekend. I was out in San Francisco teaching at uh, Warden. And so I went on to Rotten Tomatoes, and I looked for a movie where there was like a big gap. Okay? It was a movie where, like, the critics really loved it, and like, people like us who watch movies hated it. So it must be a very artsy, sort of fancy, erudite movie, and I should up my game culturally and go and see it. So I went and saw this movie called Her. And it was Joaquin Phoenix, and somehow he fell in love with this computer system that was run by Scarlett Johansson. Uh, and I, I actually fell asleep, remembered nothing about the movie, but I did remember that Joaquin Phoenix, <laughs> Joaquin Phoenix was wearing Warby Parker glasses. So identifying relevant influences is really important, but we can't always get Ryan Gosling to speak on our behalf. We also want people like Tyler Oakley. And you guys must see this in your daily business life. There's actually a fascinating academic study called the Million Follower Fallacy that endorses this. So if I were to take Linnea or anyone else here in the room, there's kind of three measures of your social impact in a social system, like TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, you know, take your pick. There's three things. One is how many followers do you have? That's your general fame. Beyonce, Shaquille O'Neal, they're famous, they have a lot of followers, so does Ryan Gosling. Number two, there's a measure of how many shares you get. That's kind of a measure, is your content any good? So the New York Times, the Washington Post get a lot of shares, economists, because they create great content. And then the third thing is, do people actually like you? Do they put little hearts and other measures of positive affect? So it's fame, it's good content, and it's positive affect. And what this research showed is, you know, just fame itself, like, you know, getting Beyonce to be the spokesperson for our store might be good, but, you know, maybe it's not that great. What's actually really good is someone who's really focused on the concept of convenience and runs around mowing lawns and has a cool truck in, you know, Minneapolis, and like that guy who has 50,000 followers that people love, he's actually going to be more influential. So looking for those special people that have real positive affect and shareability, and this is what this gentleman Tyler Oakley had. So when he went on YouTube and he showed his followers the Warby Parker box of five frames, and I'm going to show you a video on this later on, and he opened it up and he talked about it, his followers really loved it. So it's not just the famous people, it's these kind of people. And then also there's a third class of people, this is you and I. And there's going to be a lot of really interesting discussion in the sessions later today around loyalty and just how absolutely critical that is running the right kind of loyalty program. So this is about driving and incentives driving word of mouth through the use of extrinsic incentives often monetarily. 
So I'll give you an example going back to diapers.com. Okay? Now, when we set up diapers.com, of course, we want to acquire new customers to diapers.com. And in the digital economy, one of the best sources of new customers is the base of existing customers that you have, that asset. So we put an incentive program in place that said, if I refer Linnea, okay, and she becomes a customer of diapers.com, um, then I get a $1 credit that goes into my diapers.com bank account. Okay, that, that makes sense? Some of you guys might have even done this. If I refer, you know, Tom, someone else, I get another dollar. And so the question became, on the first 100,000 customers at diapers.com, how many people do you think could be bothered to actually, you know, activate and, and sort of act on this incentive? Well, it turned out there was about 8% of people did that. 8,000 out of 100,000. And then we analyzed the data a little bit more and we said, well, you know, the average person who's doing this referral is referring four people each. So this is actually pretty good for Mark and the executives. From 8,000 people, they got 32,000 new customers. And I'll say something in a moment about whether they're better than the average customer or not. Okay? In fact, who thinks the customers that come in through word of mouth are better or worse than the average customer? Who thinks they're better? I, I think I can see enough hands. Who thinks that every question I have is a 50-50? Who thinks they're worse? Okay, not very many, okay. So they are better, and I'll explain why in a moment. So 8,000 turned into 32,000. Now that was interesting, but here's where the rubber really meets the road in the digital economy. It's not just about the average. The digital economy is about the extreme. Think about Gangnam style. Think about the ice bucket challenge, okay? The digital economy is the world of the extreme. So we would let people print out paper coupons. They could put them on every car they found in National Harbor. They could go absolutely nuts if they wanted to. And we found that the top 100 customers referred 150 customers each. That pool of 100 brought us 15,000 new people. And the people coming in through the word of mouth mechanism, on average, they referred at a rate of 16%, not eight. Why? Because people who come in through word of mouth tend to be better customers. I don't refer to you baby diapers if I don't think you've got a baby. And if you come in through that mechanism, you're more likely to tell other people the same thing. So we had this notion of a super customer, and then when Mark launched Jet.com, after selling diapers.com, so in 2015, what's his biggest problem? Well, his biggest advantage is he can sell into the whole US. What's the problem? He's got no customers. So what he does, taking that research, is he puts out on the internet an incentive. So the gentleman in the front, if you refer five customers, five email addresses, I give you free shipping for a year. And the lady in the front here, if you refer 10, I give you free shipping for two years. But then he put out a really interesting carrot. I don't know if you guys remember this. And I'm not suggesting that we do this, but think about it, right? Be creative. He said, if you refer the most people of anyone, I will give you 100,000 shares of stock in Jet.com. And what's our principle? The internet is the world of extremes. And so there's a really funny guy here called Eric Martin there with his wife and his baby. He's wearing a Jet.com t-shirt. Because Eric Martin spent a bit of his own money to build some software, but he referred 8,147 people, and he got 100,000 shares of, jet, uh, of stock in Jet.com. And when Walmart bought it for 3.3 billion, that guy made 20 million bucks. The internet is the world of the extreme. So with our customers, of course measure their value. Of course try to measure their value as referrers, but think about what's your story, Who's telling it? The sort of famous people. And then for regular people like you and I, what's the incentive structure that you have in place to keep the engine going? Okay, cool. So now let's get into the third piece here. What is a, um, this sort of gets a bit easier. This one starts with S. What's a setting or a place for displaying and creating experiences? Hmm? I think I heard something. A scene. Oh, yeah, that's actually pretty good. That, does, that starts with S, not too bad. Okay, it's a showroom, all right? So a showroom, and what I want us to think about here is how do we use physical space of our stores and even things that are not necessarily stores? So let me give you an example of a company that we recently invested in that I think you guys might find interesting. So if you think about the evolution of retail, so evolution of retail from year dot until about 1994, before Amazon and e-commerce, retail meant me going into a physical store that was a special place designed for retail, like a shirt store to basically buy the shirt, right, or a department store. And in that store, two things took place. 
I got information about, yeah, you should wear a white shirt, and I also did fulfillment of product. I handed over money and I was given the product. So up until about the 90s, all commerce transactions that were retail happened in physical stores, and the two functions of giving customers information and like getting their money and giving them product, information and fulfillment, were all done in physical stores. And then in 1994, e-commerce comes along, you know, Amazon and others, and now there's shirts.com. And those two core functions I can now perform purely digitally. I can go to shirts.com, get pictures, read reviews, buy a shirt, and then it gets sent to me. So the fulfillment and the exchange of information was both digital. And now, of course, you've got sort of a two-by-two two matrix. I could go to tiffany's.com, as I did last uh, Christmas, and buy a, a bracelet for my niece. And then I could go into the store in Soho and pick it up. So I got the information on the website, but then I did the physical fulfillment in the store. Or if I need a new pair of pants, I, as a man, I could go into a Bonobos store, try a bunch of pants on, get information about style, and then have it shipped to my house so I've got information offline and fulfillment happening online. So these are all the possibilities. But now, actually, there's another possibility that I think is even more fascinating and even more interesting. So we recently invested in a company called Minoan which pays homage, I think, to the civilization of traders in Atlantis. So Minoan, what Minoan does is it makes all the other environments that we're in shoppable. So if you were to go with your family and stay in an Airbnb and you really like the espresso machine, why couldn't you buy it? So think of all the time that you spend in other physical spaces that are not retail, sort of Airbnb meets retail. So this is what I want us to think about as we're going through the content here. How can we make physical space more interesting, more dynamic, more experiential, and places where commerce can be conducted. Okay, so in order to kind of anchor us here, I'm gonna to refer to some research that we did a couple of years ago that I think makes this point quite nicely. So we wrote a paper um, that we published called The Store is Dead, Long Live the Store, okay? And the whole point of this paper was to say, boy, we're in this retail apocalypse that everybody talks about all the time, and yet within the apocalypse, there's some people who do really, really well. And what are the differentiating factors from those who are going down the drain versus those who are going well? Fortunately for us in convenience, the whole boat, you know, the tide of tailwinds is kind of making us all go pretty well. But in general, in retail, some retail is falling off the cliff and some is not. And what we found was the retail that was doing really well did two things. First of all, the spaces were highly experiential and engaging. And then when customers came into those spaces, they were highly motivated then to create content which they could share with other people that then benefits the narrative of the whole business. Another thing related to that that we found very, very interesting, as you guys think about how e-commerce plays a role, okay, in your own operations, uh, and how e-commerce plays a role in connection to physical stores. So is anyone here in the room familiar with, we, we put the brand up earlier, it was bought by Walmart in 2017 for $310 million, the brand Bonobos. It's basically J. Crew online sort of for guys, right? And um, the first product that was sold by Bonobos was basically men's pants. And actually a funny story here around the naming of the company, the reason it's called Bonobos, um, the founder was a Stanford MBA, is a bonobos is a special kind of monkey, kind of an intelligent monkey, but a monkey nevertheless. And he said, if you want to sell stuff to guys, uh, guys kind of shop like monkeys, okay? So this is not to be, I don't know if you can tell these kind of jokes in 2022, but I'll put it out there anyway. Um, you know, if I talk to Linnea and, a, and Heather and some of the ladies in the back here who are running the, the conference, and uh, you know, they went out for a few hours running around National Harbor and they came back and they've got big smiles on their face. And I said, hey, Linnea, you guys, you guys look like you had a good time. What have you been doing? I said, well, you know, we, we went out for a few hours and we went shopping. I said, well, that's absolutely fantastic. What did you buy? Oh, nothing, nothing. We just went shopping, okay? Now, if Bill and I go out shopping for three hours and we come back with nothing, are we smiling? No, we're not, because men are like monkeys. They go to bonobos.com and they buy three pants, three shirts, and two pairs of shoes, and then they're done for the year, okay? So... Bonobos is a really interesting case study in retail because the founder, he had a good exit, he sold it to uh, Walmart for $300 million, but he was very, very clear in his digital presence of saying that retail was dead in 2022. You would never, ever want to own a physical store selling clothing. That would be insane, that would be staff, that would be inventory, it would be all kinds of headache. And from 2010 onwards, roughly when he was getting going, everything in retail for apparel would be digital. 
And then he quickly realized that when you sell a tactile product like clothing that has non-digital attributes, people want to touch and feel it, some people might want to do that in a store. So what he did is he started letting guys come into his office in Manhattan, try on product in that office, and then have it shipped to them, which then led him to start something called the Guide Shop. And now they're all over the United States. They're fo small footprint stores, maybe twice the size of the stage, where a man can go in, you're given a cup of coffee, they tell you, yeah, you should wear black, this is the style, and so on. So the concept of a store that carried no inventory, but was a store that you could just have an experience and then the product shipped, was started by Bonobos. So we got hold of some of their data and we said, well, what does this do for the business? Is this good for the business? How does it affect customer behavior and so on? So what we did is we went through all their data and we took two customers and we'll call them Tom and Bob, okay? And Tom and Bob were matched statistically to be identical customers buying the same amount of stuff uh, and buying product from bonobos.com. And then at a certain point in time, Bob goes into a Bonobos guide shop. And in that guide shop, he has an exchange with a salesperson who tells him a bit more about the store and so on. And then thereafter, Tom and Bob continue to buy online. What we found was super interesting. Bob, who went into the physical store, even if only once, had a very different customer lifestyle trajectory thereafter. He not only bought more, spent more on every average transaction, he also brought from a, bright, a broader breadth of the assortment and he was less likely to return product. Does that make sense to you guys intuitively? And it, these were really big statistical and economic effects and we call this customer supercharging. And customer supercharging, if I give a personal analogy, it'll kind of reinforce the point. So if the gentleman in the front there, uh, again, you know, being a professor, sometimes I used to call people out. What's your name, sir, in the front? Yeah. Frank. So let's say Frank and I don't know each other, and I send Frank an email, and he gets this email from David at Idea Farm Ventures. He's like, who's this guy? And he just deletes it. It's a very low energy electronic exchange. And then at some point, though, I call Frank up, and we have a discussion on the phone, and we hear each other's accents, and we talk about stuff, retail, whatever. Now the energy of our relationship is just elevated a little bit, right? And then we both come to National Harbor, and we go out, we have a cup of coffee, and we chit chat, and now the intimacy of our relationship has increased to here. The next time he receives an email from me, does the energy drop all the way back down to electronic? No, it doesn't, it stays elevated. Our relationship has been supercharged and so it is with customers. So the power of a physical space interaction with a customer, not only is good in that interaction, it also affects the trajectory of how they behave in the future online, is the point of that research, okay. All right, so what do these showrooms look like? Um, they might look like these Warby Parker environments here that are all designed to look like a library, paying homage to the brand name. They might also be showrooms on the move, so you can see CU Convenience uh, in Korea, you can see the Warby Parker school bus here. What was fascinating about these environments is if you take that Warby Parker school bus, and the school bus is obviously a very iconic thing in North America, the yellow school bus, and the thing would drive around America. And let's say it stops in Washington, D.C., what we would do is we would measure, did anything else happen in Washington, D.C. when the bus stopped there? And what we found is they sold more stuff through warbyparker.com, and they had more people go into the showroom, and that effect you know, went up, more traffic to the website, more sales, and then the bus departed for Philadelphia. And what happened then is the traffic lift dropped off, but it never went back to the base level where it was before. So again, engaging in cus with customers in mobile environments also has the ability then to generate content and to generate intimacy and momentum with those customers. Um, I don't know if anyone here is, I'm not an investor in this company, but if anyone here is in the market for outdoor furniture, there's a fascinating company based in LA that I think again is partly the future of retail here. Uh, it's called Outer. They sell outdoor furniture, basically restoration hardware at slightly cheaper prices. And rather than build their own showroom, if Frank happens to buy some outer furniture and he puts it in his backyard in the Hollywood Hills in LA, if he agrees to it, I can come and I can take photographs of his backyard and I put it up on the website, Frank's Backyard. And then another customer, let's say the gentleman here in the front, if you want to go and check that furniture out, you can book an appointment to go to Frank's, you know, Frank might not, you look like a nice guy, but he might not let you into his home, okay? But he might let you into his backyard and while in the backyard, you can check out the product, and if you buy it, then he gets a couple hundred bucks. So what I really want us to think about here is the store 
is an amplifier, number one. The store is something that sometimes happens not necessarily in a four-war environment, but it could be a mobile environment, or it could also even be in the customer's home, because that's where digital enablement is allowing this to take place. And it's the same thing with fulfillment. I don't know if you've come across some of these companies like WareCloud. WareCloud is kind of Airbnb meets storage. So let's say Frank, I'm picking on Frank since I know Frank's name. Frank has a spare room in his house. To make a bit of extra money, he might let someone go and stay there on Airbnb. But also he's got like, you know, room in the closet. Why wouldn't he store a bunch of Estee Lauder makeup in the closet such that then through fulfillment infrastructure, someone could come by his home, pick it up, and give it to that lady who just lives around the corner. Have you guys started looking at this kind of stuff? Companies like Hurry and Carry that do really sophisticated last mile delivery, which of course is amazing for convenience. Having inventory, not just like a store, doesn't now have to be a physical store in the way we thought of it 100 years ago. A warehouse also no longer has to be a warehouse in that same mode. Why couldn't I monetize Frank's spare wardrobe by having makeup products in there that then would be delivered locally? Because the technology makes that possible. Okay, so continuing on. This man needs glasses. He has very high standards and particular tastes. Boutiques are expensive and have left him disappointed. And with discount retailers, the results are unpredictable. So he's trying Warby Parker. The virtual try-on tool gives him recommendations to fit his face. And with the home try-on program, he gets five pairs shipped to his home for free. He can spend quality time with each pair and pick the very best one. The vintage-inspired frames are handsome and well-built. It's very important to find the right frames. And when it happens, he just sends Warby Parker his prescription, and his frames come back lenses in for $95. And for every pair they sell, Warby Parker gives a pair to someone in need. He likes that. Now he's got the frames he wants. A pair that fits right and looks good. Find your pair at warbyparker.com. Okay. All right, so again, and what's actually fascinating about that, guys, and what we're trying to do here with the where piece of the four pillars, the third piece, is to really get creative about how we get product in the hands of customers. And so again, I'll just give a bit of background on this because I think it's very interesting. So the reason Warby Parker started this home try-on program, and I'm sure there's many of us in the room who've actually used this, and not just selling glasses directly online, is because glasses have a tactile component. So here's a bit of academic jargon, but it's actually very useful. There are two kinds of attributes that every single product that is sold in retail has. Products have digital attributes and non-digital attributes, and that's it. And what's the distinction between the two? A digital attribute is an attribute that I can communicate to Frank, the customer, online or offline, and there's no confusion. So price would be a digital attribute. If it's $9.99 on the website, $9.99 in the store, there's no confusion. A non-digital attribute would be a tactile thing, like the fit and feel of the shirt or the fit of the shoes. That's a lot harder to communicate directly online. So two examples here, when Jeff Bezos started Amazon back in 1994, which is now you know, a trillion dollar company, he didn't start selling the product that was number one in catalogs, because you might say, well, the internet's just like a giant catalog, let me take what works on catalogs and sell it on the internet. No, no, he went down to number 25 on the list. And number 25 on the list was the book. And the reason he started with books is books have only non, sorry, only digital attributes. If I buy Frank's book for $9.99 and it's a book about economics and consumer, I'm not worried that when it shows up it's going to be about a romance novel. Right? There's no confusion about the product because it only has digital attributes. So the challenge for retail and the challenge for us in convenience is to think about the digital strategy for products that have non-digital attributes. And if you get it right and you do something clever, there's a lot of money to be made. So very tragic, but you guys might remember Tony Shea. 
What was the company that Tony Shea in Las Vegas started? Taiwanese American entrepreneur. I'm kind of wearing some of them right now. Zappos. So he started a company called Zappos selling shoes. And Tony realized that shoes have non-digital attributes that Frank may not be willing to buy these sneakers because he's concerned that they're not going to fit or his family is not going to like the look of them or whatever, right? So Tony, who wrote a book called Delivering Happiness, which is a fantastic book, said, don't worry, Frank, order four pairs of shoes, whatever you want, keep the one that you like, send the other ones back, and I'll take care of the whole thing. So thinking about how to deal with non-digital attributes when you're a retailer is a very important problem to solve. So what Warby Parker did here, and again, I guess this is why they say, you know, those, I guess I'm doing now, but those who can't do teach, you know, I'm sitting there as a professor, these guys are telling me they're going to start an online eyewear company, and I'm thinking to myself, what kind of ludicrous idea is this? <laughs> Don't people want to try on their glasses? Don't want to, oh yeah, we've thought of that. And what we're going to do is we're going to send them out in a box of five frames for free for five days, and the people get the tactile experience. So what's interesting about that is, number one, it gave them some press, GQ called them the Netflix of glasses. Number two, they get about 50% conversion on those boxes, meaning if they send out 100 boxes within a two month period, about half the people have actually bought a pair of glasses. And number three, if I had some control over where to send the box, if Frank were ordering it, would I rather send it to Frank's office or to Frank's home? Again, there's always only two options. Office, right? Because there's more people in the office, there's going to be more social exposure. So what we found, even when the product was not purchased, there was still an economic value through word of mouth. And then the final piece of the puzzle, when you're fully on omnichannel, you have a website and home try-on, and now you introduce showrooms. So there we found what was very interesting. Once Warby Parker opened up a showroom in a certain location, do you think that their website sales went up, stayed the same, or went down? They went up, because that showroom looks like a billboard. You walk past, the gentleman walks past the Warby Parker store, he's like, oh, it's like an advertising effect. So the web sales went up too. That's interesting. But a really interesting thing happened with the home try-on program, in locations where Warby Parker put a store, they ended up sending out fewer glasses through the home try-on program. So that looked like bad news. But what was the conversion rate that I told you on home try-on program? was 50%. What happened after they opened a showroom in a location is they sent out fewer boxes, but they got higher conversion on the boxes that they sent out. Because now when you offer your customers a lot of different options, if the customer only has two options, and she either wants to buy online or get home try-on, if she's a person who needs to touch and feel, she's going to go with the home try-on. But if now you give her three options, there's online, home try-on, and a showroom, if she really likes to touch and feel, she goes into the showroom, so the customer who gets left in the home try-on is naturally self-selecting into it and has a better fit. So thinking from a convenience retail point of view about do we have mobile, do we have boxes of e-commerce, how do we engage people in the store, all of those things must be done together. And if you get it right, like Warby Parker did, you not only have a benefit of increased demand, you also have increased operational efficiency because the home try-on program um, conversion rate actually went up. And the number of people who were returning the product actually went down. Okay? So how do we build these better sort of where physical spaces? Number one, we want to create elevated and in-depth experiences. So this kind of fascinated me. This business was worth about 200 million bucks pre-pandemic. Now it's coming back. But remember you said, we said that stores in the old days did two things. They gave people experiences and they also were places where product was transacted sort of up running into the pandemic and coming back now are stores that literally sell no product, okay? All they sell is an experience. You take your kid in there, you pay 20 bucks, and the kids, you know, jump into the sprinkle pool and, like, put pictures online. That's a new version of retail that we need to be paying attention to. If you think about, um, I don't know if we use the word friend, but, you know, if we think about Elon Musk, okay, and what that guy did for the car industry, remember back in the old days if Frank wanted to buy a new car, and he could go to any of the lots in New Jersey, and he finds a lot in New Jersey, it's got a 1,000 cars on the lot, except the one that he actually wants to buy, okay? Because in the old days, the inventory and the selling happened together. Elon Musk built a thing that's about as big as this stage with one Tesla in there that you could go in and learn everything about Nikolai Tesla and electricity and buy that thing for 50 grand on your phone. The separation of the experiential function and the fulfillment function and the creation of experiences is absolutely critical to all retail, including our sector. 
Second thing that we have to think about is, you know, what are operationally efficient locations look like for us? Do we have something like these Swift enable stores, which are kind of the ATM of retail? Do we think about locations that have zero inventory and only showcase the product and fulfillment is separated out from the two? And then number three, how do we embrace technology and encourage what I call broadcasting? So do you guys have, you know, uh, explicit strategies that get customers to engage digitally when you're in your physical environment? So I won't take my phone out, but I'll use this. The mobile phone is an absolute game changer for five reasons, an absolute game changer, okay? Because the mobile phone sort of does five things um, that weren't really possible before, and it's affected every industry from convenience to travel to, you know, where you pick up your dry cleaning and so on. So this little device, I guess I'll pull this one out, so it has five properties that make it really interesting. Number one, it is a device upon which billions of people now have a distribution channel and a payment channel in their pocket. Wow. So this is going to lead into our next point about data. Billions of people, all of our customers now have a distribution channel and a payment channel in their pocket. You can take their money and send them stuff. Wow. Number two, this is a device upon which people, I'm going to straighten up now, are constantly snacking all the day long. What do I mean by snacking? Well, remember in the old days, you know, you got in the elevator here at the hotel, Frank gets in, you sort of move a little bit to the side, you're slightly uncomfortable. You try not to make eye contact, you stand there like that. Now if you get into the elevator or you queue for your latte at Starbucks, every single person is, you know, turkey neck hunched over, right? People are snacking. People are on this device hundreds of times a day. That's an opportunity for them to be consuming and creating our content. Number three, it's geo-aware. This device knows where you go. Business like Waze wouldn't exist. So it's a distribution and a payment mechanism. It's a device upon we, which people snack. It's geo-aware. Number four, it's a device that allows the creation and sharing of rich content. And number five, it amplifies the most powerful form of marketing, which is word of mouth. So I can say, hey, you know, Frank, have you tried this thing called Uber? Don't wait for a cab. So those five properties of mobile have to be absolutely in our minds as we think about our digital strategy. Okay. Now let's go into the last piece, and this is like super relevant for everything we're doing at the conference. It's already been spoken about this morning. Um, systematic of knowledge of the world, gained through experimentation. The word starts with S. What is this? What is this? Okay, there was a, there was a hush. <laughs> oh, bingo, science, thank you. Science. So, you know, science and marketing, science would always, you know, like airline food, marketing science, used to sound like an oxymoron. Retail science absolutely is not, right? Everything we should be doing and driving in our business should have a scientific mindset behind it, meaning that I have a conjecture that if I move the drink container here and I change the path through the store in this way, my velocity will go up. Now let me test it out in some stores and have controls not doing, doing something different. So the scientific mindset of thinking about customers is absolutely critical to what we do in convenience. And again, there are three pieces here. So here I'm just, uh, before I get into it, I'm just showing a book. Um, it's not written by me, it's written by a friend of mine, but I think it's a really fascinating book about how this whole thing is gonna work. Prediction Machines just said, what if you had a tool that allowed you to forecast stuff better? So it's kind of AI and all of those kind of things, but in the language that we speak, which is the language of business. So let's say Frank and I were trying to forecast demand for the government about how many new houses would be built in Q4, which is really important. In the old days, they just used the historical number of houses and they predict a trend line. Now what we could do is we could add data that on April the 29th, 2022, how many people type the word mortgage into Google? Because that's a signal of intent, and if we put that into the model, we'll be able to predict better. So that's what that book is about. So the three things, science, not service. Science, not service, is our mindset going forward in convenience. And we've got three things that we're thinking about here. So number one, how do we surface information to customers, show them things that they're going to be interested in before they even have to search for them? Now, this is an interesting tension because it hits privacy and all kinds of other things. This is about being the butler, not the stalker, okay? Like, if I, if I check in here and there's like, you know, the economist is next to the bed, I'm, oh, that's kind of nice. People know I like to read the economist. If there's a Negroni there with a single ice cube, that's good. Sometimes I like a Negroni, you know, but if it's too much, it's too much. So how do we be a butler, not a stalker? How do we surface information to customers that is relevant? 
Number two, how do we think about DNA? A lot of the most successful companies in the retail space of recent times have created in a feeling of DNA. So whether it's you know, Stitch Fix, which is basically an artificial intelligence company masquerading as a seller of clothing, or whether it's Care Of, if you're into vitamins, a company that a friend of mine started just before the pandemic, he sold it for $225 million to Bayer, and what he did is he just took the insight that buying vitamins is kind of a horrible experience, because Frank and I should have different kind of vitamins, probably based on our activity levels, age, and so on. And if he took us through an onboarding survey at careof.com asking things about our lifestyle, and it shows up D to C, you know, made for Frank, that's going to resonate with him as a customer. So how do we think about offering our customers things that are different? And then number three, this is one of my favorite things, um, how do we take pieces of data that seem to be unrelated and we bring in insights about our customers? And so I'll give a sort of fun example here that re relates to, to credit, but you can think about how it relates to retail. So of course, if, again, sorry Frank, if I want to give Frank a loan, of course I'm going to look at his, does he pay his credit cards, what are his balances, has he bought a car before, et cetera, et cetera. But in addition to coming up to the decision of whether he's loan worthy, what if I had access to the books that he bought on Amazon? And I saw that most of them were all about personal financial responsibility, I'd probably score him differently because of that data. So how do we take things in store and out of store that seem to be unrelated and yet give us insight into the customers? Okay, so with all of this said, we're now just running down to the last minute, so let me just recap what we've done here today. Obviously we went through the context, thinking about the psychographic, these are the two messages I want you guys to take away. It's the psychographic as much as it is the demographic, and then number two, the absolutely critical thing as we address this customer in this sort of boss framework, bonding, not branding, what is the story we're telling? The functional, emotional, symbolic value, how are we authentic and transparent, what's our community? Number two, it's not just selling a story to someone, it's having that story so ingrained that they tell it to other people. You know? And that's absolutely something that we have to be on top of. Number three, our physical real estate is critical, it's a core asset, how we utilize it and use it, but are there other ways that we can also create meaningful experiences for customers? And then number four, the science piece, how do we get into the DNA of the organization that we're scientific in our mindset? We collect the right data, we test our theories, and based on what comes back, we modify, adjust, and go forward.